nearly $9 billion outlay for 100,000 new police officers over six years. Congressman Gerald Solomon chairs the hearing. The Rules Committee will come to order, and the matter before us today is H.R. 728, the Local Government Law Enforcement Block Grants Act of 1995. Uh, I have a brief uh, opening statement before we hear testimony, after which I would yield to the ranking minority leader, my good friend, uh, Mr. Motley. I would like to start by quoting the, uh, from the Judiciary Committee report on this bill. The Local Government Law Enforcement Block Grants Act of 1995 represents an important step by this Congress to assist local governments throughout the country to help them con uh, confront crime. And in stark contrast to the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act of 1994, it does so without prescribing the specific programs that localities must implement in order to receive funding. In other words, no more micromanaging by this Congress and these bureaucrats here in Washington. This bill provides resources for localities to respond to their unique crime problems with their own solutions. And the solutions in Glens Falls, New York, might be a lot different than they are in Los Angeles, California. It, presents, it, it uh, represents more funds and greater flexibility for the vast majority of localities throughout America than was provided in last year's crime bill. This bill repeals Title I of the 1994 crime bill, the Public Safety and Policing Section, and replaces it with a block grant program that provides funds to units of local government to assist them in their efforts to reduce crime and to improve public safety. The act authorizes $10 billion over five years and requires that grant funds uh, supplement and not supplement, uh, supplant state and local funds. For maximum flexibility, the funds are provided with almost no strings attached, including no matching fund requirement, which is so important to small municipalities that don't have the tax base to put up matching funds so often. I believe that this bill is a vast improvement to last year's prescriptive crime bill. Rather than providing a federal solution to a local crime problem, this bill allows the local government to develop its own unique solution. And with that, I yield to my good friend uh, from Massachusetts uh, for an opening statement, if he cares to. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> I haven't seen the rule, but I understand this is another uh, modified close rule where the, you have a time okay. limit on it. You paying attention, David? Yes, sir. Now, this section you're talking about, the $10 billion, that's the section that we were going to use for putting police officers on the streets, wasn't it? It was the uh, section that uh, dictated what the local governments had to do to participate. Well, I thought everybody here wanted more police in the street. Now you'll settle for tanks and everything else. Is that right? Well, we could use some tanks up in the Adirondack Mountains, I suppose, but uh, we're more interested in, uh, in equipment to, um, uh, for the uh, police officers that we have now. On the other hand, some, uh, some areas need more police officers. So under this provision, I think we're going to let Mr. Hyde explain that to us when he, uh, when he testifies, the yeah, distinguished I'm, chairman of I'm the I'm sure uh, the distinguished the chairman committee. will, but I'd just like to talk how this you're, you're welcome. interacts with our rules that have been so open. <clears throat> uh, Speaking from experience, I think it would be wise, my Republican colleagues, uh, to allow any all and all members t t to get rid of all the extraordinary stuff and just uh, go forward. When you're going for blo block ranch, remember the last time we did that, people bought limousines for the chiefs of police, fixed wing aircraft, tanks, and everything else. In fact, I think one town, Henry, had four police cars, and there are only three police officers in the town. And I, I just think that uh, we just can't afford to go on uh, this way. But I can stand, understand a little partisan desire, Mr. Chairman, uh, but this is ridiculous. This bill actually guts the very heart and soul of last year's widely popular and bipartisan crime bill and replaces it with a lot of local... Uh, puts the money directly into the uh, in law enforcement's hands without having uh, any mandate. 
I, 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 I wish at least one person on your side would listen to me. Uh, How'd you like it so far, Harry? Uh, I thought it bordered out with the on the tape. Oh, okay. You were listening, then. We, we are all listening because we want to respond to you. Let's uh, have a little, little order in the committee, but go ahead, Mr. Bokley. All right. But I just want to you know, every member on this panel here gets police officers under the spell. But if you change it now and just say that the, it goes under the block grant to the local law enforcement, those police officers may not be there. They may be something else. Uh, and it's being handed out on a no strings attached, do whatever you want to do with the fund uh, of $10 billion. Now where I come from, that's a lot of taxpayers money and that may very well be poorly spent. In fact, the money doesn't have to be spent on crime prevention at all. It can be used for yachts, bazookas, armored personnel carriers, or a whole lot of other things that will do nothing about the crime on our street. Now, I noticed that it has been changed so that this would need a, uh, an attorney general's waiver to go beyond uh, crime, but that's a recent addition, I understand. So according to the Justice Department, passing H.R. 728 will result in, now this is according to the Justice Department, fewer cops in the streets, fewer violent, violent criminals behind bars, and less assistance to state and local governments that are trying to fight crime. So I don't know what we're doing here. I thought that we had a pretty good bill as far as cops. I mean, I, I think your side said that was the only part that was anything, the rest was pork. Now you've added to the pork by allowing the local people to do whatever they want out. So I said I haven't seen the role yet, but I just want to uh, make an observation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, we thank you for your, for your comments, and um, I just would uh, point out that there are provisions in the bill that uh, specifically prohibit tanks and armored personnel carriers, fixed-wing aircraft, limousines, even real estate. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the big contentious uh, issues last year uh, were things like midnight basketball and dance lessons. Uh, this uh, takes out all of that and, uh, and puts this money to good use. And uh, well, I, I won't carry this on. Uh, I would yield to the Chairman Emeritus, though, of the... Uh, of the committee. Uh, I thank the chairman for yielding. I know Mr. Moakley said that there was a great bill that we passed last year. My statement after the passage of the bill was that it was a crime itself instead of being a crime bill, a crime that it passed as it was. There's nothing wrong with local control. The federal government is getting too big and too powerful, and we should curb that power, and having the block grants is one way to do it, and I support it. And I hope that we can do away with many of the provisions of the crime bill last year and re undo the crime that was created when we passed it. Thank you. Are there any other uh, opening statements, uh, Mr. Bielenson? No opening statement? Any other members? Uh, Mr. McGinnis from Colorado. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to state uh, something about the substance of the bill very quickly. And then the, the rule, in regards to the rule, uh, in, in deference to uh, my good friend over there, uh, this rule is a lot more open than what the Democratic Control Rules Committee gave to us last year on the crime bill. And I think you're going to see the, the debate excuse me, on the House floor much more of a heartier debate from both sides of the aisle. In regards to the substance, I think we need to clear up one statement, and this has been verified by a number of, uh, of uh, sources, and that is that last year's bill did not provide 100,000 police officers. In fact, the White House later clarified that and said they were really talking about 100,000 police years. Now, I used to be a cop. I'd never heard of a police year before the White House announced it last year. But a police year is the number of years times the number of officers. So the way they got the 100,000 is they really have 20,000 police officers times five years. That's how they got to the 100,000. But I think suffice it to say, even at the 20,000 mark, they're not even close to that. This bill will allow us to get right into the community, and if the community wants to put more police on the street, they've got that option. It's going to work. Last year's bill may have had good intent, and I don't argue that. 
but the results are zero in my opinion. Thank well, you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman Neal. Sure, I'll yield. Uh, I know in my city uh, we've already put police on the street under the, under this uh, law, and, and, and a little in some of my towns we've already put police. And I think I read the list uh, the other day of every member here that had additional police officers uh, put on their streets as a result of the crime bill. So it, it the results are zero. There are people out there. They've got the uh, cops bill. Uh, they've got the anti-gang bills, uh, and, and I just think that the. These are the, the, the bills that can do something about crime rather than allowing each person to be his own uh, inspector general and decide what he wants to do himself. I think that well, since reclaim. it's federal money, I, I, I don't, if, if I'm giving somebody $10 billion, uh, I don't think it's a bad idea to put a couple of restrictions on it. Well, reclaiming my time, all this bill does is build on any of the good intentions that you had last year, and I think it's worthy of your support. Well, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, you, you just said, Joe, that uh, I, that you uh, feel that there should be some constraints on it. Chairman Solomon has just outlined that the items that you said that could be purchased from tanks, armored personnel carriers, limousines, fixed-wing aircraft, those kinds of things would not be allowed under this. And it seems to me that we are basically uh, saying that the, the attorney general says it's okay. Yeah. Well, it seems to well, me that we are basically. Sense. Yeah. It seems to me that we are basically saying that our local government can't determine how best to deal with the crime problem in that area with your response and the present law. And that's why this seems to be a very responsible, balanced approach to a pressing problem. And I don't want to take any more time. We want to hear from our witnesses. Yes, Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And I, and I would like to get on with it. Did Mrs. Walthos have any statement? Just very briefly, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm Walthos anxious to get Utah. to the testimony as well. but. I don't think I can let this go by without commenting on the dissenting views that were filed by uh, the dissenters from the committee, where there is nothing short of an attack on the integrity of local law enforcement officials. In the dissenting views, it, it, the claim is made that this bill allows yeah. these funds to be used by local officials for ill-advised, wasteful, and even counterproductive uses. And then they go on to say that the proponents of this bill argue that these federal dollars taken from the taxes of hardworking Americans all over the land should be showered back without meaningful guidelines, all in the name of local control. We say that mindlessly obstinate and ideologically inspired mantra will result in the end of five years in billions of dollars being thrown down a rat hole with no evidence of what they were used for or whether any results were obtained. Mr. Chairman, I think that the arrogance and condescension manifested by these dissenting views are exactly what has fueled the state's rights movement that is sweeping across our country. The same people who elected those local elected officials are the people who elected us. And for us to pretend that the judgment of those people was in error when they elected those local officials and yet was not in error when they elected us and that we therefore should substitute our judgment for the judgment of the people charged with fighting crime at the local levels it is, is something that I think should not go uncommented on in this hearing. I think that this bill tries to restore what I think is the proper balance between micromanagement by the federal government and appropriate exercise of, of judgment and jurisdiction by local law enforcement officials. Mr. General Lady, you, you Gladly. Uh, we passed this bill last year in a bipartisan uh, flavor, and uh, I don't think anybody's given it adequate time to work out. So all of a sudden to change uh, the funding of $10 billion uh, into block grants and allow the local sheriff, so to speak, uh, the, uh, the wherewithal to do uh, whatever he wants to do. I don't know what in enhances uh, public uh, security really means. Uh, I mean, uh, does it mean? The what? You're not going to be, don't tell me you're going to be herded like cattle, Mr. Pratt, because, uh, because an election's uh, taken it's place. Done. I, I, reclaiming my time, Mr. You have the floor. Yeah, reclaiming my time, Mr. Chairman, I, I would simply say that I think the whole point that, that my friend from Massachusetts raises is that local law enforcement officials can better determine what fighting crime means and that this body should not be substituting its judgment for the wishes of local law enforcement officials, again, who are elected by the same people 
who elected us, but they elected them to do a very specific job fighting crime while they send us back to try to deal with a host of different issues. And so I think it is appropriate that we make changes necessary to allow local jurisdictions to do what they think is best in their community. You pointed out the other day uh, that I, my, my district had received funds. You said the president had, had made a point of the fact that the Rules Committee members received those, those, uh, those slots for police officers. My question would be, is the president prepared to pay for them when these funds run out? Because I now have seven temporary additional police officers in my district, and no one in this body is prepared to pay for them after those funds run out. And so we have them for a short time, and the question is whether those funds could better have been used not for tanks and limousines, but for additional patrol cars, for additional officer training, for protective equipment for those officers. There are a host of other things besides cops on the beat that this money can be used for under this bill. And I think it's appropriate to let the people whom we trust to patrol our streets make the determinations to how that money can best be spent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're going to move on to this hearing, but the gentlelady is uh, absolutely correct. The sheriff of Warren County, New York, knows a lot more about the crime problems than I do or than any member of this body does. We should not be dictating to them. Uh, and I would hope the gentlelady would take the time uh, on the debate on the rule uh, to read in the, some of the uh, remarks in the, of the minority views here. They're ridiculous. Let, let's get on to the hearing, and uh, at this time I'd like to recognize uh, one of the most distinguished members of, uh, of this House, the Chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Mr. Henry Hyde. And Henry, uh, we thank you for the, uh, the unbelievable work that you and your committee is uh, doing uh, to bring uh, these measures before us today. Well, I thank you, you Mr. Floor. Chairman, for that extravagant introduction, and I'm uh, most grateful, uh, uh, if unworthy. And I, I want Mr. Mokley to know I was kidding. When I said his statement was mediocre, it was, it was really adequate. And uh, no, it was good. It was good, and I, and I appreciate it. I wouldn't mind that anybody else took your section of beautiful wordsmith. No, it was really good. It was instructive and stimulating, and I shan't soon forget it. Well, I'm writing the book. I would put you down as a sponsor. I want to buy, uh, I want to do a blurb on the back cover, if I might. Uh, well, actually, the book is only made up of seven blurbs. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Let's, let's get on with the hearing anyway. Oh, you're, you're too nervous. Uh, I, very, I haven't been called down to the floor for a moment, and uh, Mr. Dreyer, the Vice Mr. Chairman, will take over. Henry, I'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Uh, to date, this, as this committee knows, we have passed three provisions of the Republican Anti-Crime Initiative in the Contract with America, the Victim Restitution Act, Exclusionary Rule Reform Act, and the Effective Death Penalty Act, and each has passed, I'm happy to say, by resounding bipartisan majorities. So I come to this committee today to present the last of the six crime bills that are included in the anti-crime package. And this is H.R. 728, the Local Government Law Enforcement Block Grant Act of 1995. Now this bill takes a decidedly different and I must say welcome approach to law enforcement funding. Our proposal provides $10 billion in block grant programs to uh, or in block grants rather to local governments to support various law enforcement initiatives in their communities during the hearings on this bill witness after witness testified that law enforcement and prevention policies are best made at the local the grassroots level and witness after witness told us to please give them more latitude more flexibility in designing and prioritizing their law enforcement programs this bill gives local officials that flexibility to design local approaches to controlling crime in their own communities. This is a big country. This is a diverse country. The problems of Boise, Idaho are different from the problems of Brooklyn, New York. And you need to give the flexibility to those people in the front lines, in the trenches, to decide how they may best cope with their local individualized problems. And to, to think that all wisdom resides in Washington, in this great nanny state, uh, is just a mistake. And with the election on November 8th, this new philosophy of revitalizing local government, having local people make decisions that affect their lives, the, it has a high-flown name in uh, Thomistic philosophy. It's called subsidiarity. 
that element of government that's closest to where the problem exists is the most useful to, to give resources to, and that's what we're trying to do. Critics of this bill complain that it repeals common sense prevention programs and eliminates the earmarked funding for community policing, cops on the beat, um, midnight basketball, and other programs and various demonstration products. Well, uh, uh, projects, it does. But, but we don't take money away from proven beneficial programs. We simply withhold, refrain, restrain ourselves from dictating which program ought to be implemented as last year's act did. Last year's act said we know best, here are the programs and here's the money and here are the forms you fill out. We're saying you know best, here's the money, democracy with a small d. More importantly, this bill recognizes earmarking money for additional police on the beat may not be what every city wants. And you know, we kid about tanks and fixed wing, fixed wing aircrafts and limousines. I can certainly envision a sting operation where you'd need limousines, you'd need to rent them. I can envision a hostage situation that could, where you might want to rent a tank, for that matter. It depends on the situation. Uh, so, uh, well, I don't... It also depends on where you're parking. Where you're parking? Well, yes, uh, I suppose that's... I hadn't thought of that, Mr. Mopley. Uh, in any event, I recall the mayor of New York, Mr. Giuliani, telling us he didn't want more policemen. He needed technical help, technological help. But he had enough policemen. Now, that's been disputed by some, but I, it was said in my presence uh, and I, I remember it because it was a startling statement. Uh, so earmarking money for family unit demonstration projects might not be what, say, the people of Peoria want. But if they do, they can make that decision and they can undertake those programs. So this bill recognizes different localities have different needs and different law enforcement priorities. It understands that each local community has its own concept of what's going to work in that community. There are probably as many different ways and methods of stopping and preventing crime as there are members of the House. And that, of course, proves my point. Earmarking billions of dollars for police on the beat with matching funds provisions, which is what last year's act did, locked out those communities from any funding whatsoever if they didn't have the matching funds. It locks out those communities that might not need more police, but could use the money for police cars or bulletproof vests or for metal detectors at local public schools. If they didn't want to institute midnight basketball, then they were out of luck. They couldn't get that money. If they thought more money should be allocated for drug courts than for community policing programs under last year's act, that was too bad. You do it our way or you do it no way. Congress told the local communities, we know best, father knows best. This bill changes that. Under this bill, community policing, drug courts, cops on the beat, and any other law enforcement or prevention initiative can, and I suspect will be funded. And by the way, we trust local officials. We trust them. There is a mistrust, a distrust, in the minority position in opposition to local control. On Wednesday, when I was before this committee for H.R. 667 and H.R. 668, Mr. Moakley read off a list that identified the Republican members' districts that were given funds for new police officers by the Department of Justice. Funding for those police officers, unfortunately, is for only three years. Then the locality that receives this wonderful gift has to pick up the cost for the remainder of those officers' careers. That can get pretty costly, especially for our smaller communities. Under H.R. 728, state set-aside formula, however, local communities in Massachusetts will split more than 46.5 million. Communities in Ohio will split more than 58.5 million. Local governments in New York will split 203.3 million. And communities in California will divide 338.4 million each year for five years. The beauty of this bill is that those localities will decide how that money will be spent to combat their unique crime problems. The bill returns the decision-making authority to the towns and the cities and the neighborhoods 
and back to the people. If a community wishes to sponsor a community policing program, after school sports program, a tutoring program, neighborhood watch program, or any other program they believe will have a beneficial impact on the crime problem in their locality, then under this bill, they can do it. If they decide to spend block grant funds to put more police in the streets or in the schools or metal detectors in the schools to improve the weapons in the hands of their police or they need more prosecutors in the courtrooms or they need boot camps or they need drug courts or they need community police uh, on the streets in their neighborhood, they can do so, but it's their choice, not our choice. Local decisions for local needs based on their experience and their judgment. The local government law enforcement block grants of this act is preferred over the specific mandated, big government, heavy-handed, unproven, experimental social programs of the 1994 act. <coughs> so that's what we want to do. That's the, the, the prudence, the, the wisdom, the common sense of letting the locals decide. And that is a <coughs> sea change from last year where uh, as I say, the nanny state made all these decisions. Uh, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, Mr. Uh, <clears throat> I, let me ask you, uh, as you know, uh, the crime bill was divided into six bills, and uh, you were uh, good enough to get, to get them to us in a timely manner. Uh, this is the sixth. We will, be, we will be bringing a rule to the floor sometime later this morning or this afternoon um, on, the, on the fifth bill. Uh, on this one, how much time uh, do you think um, it would take to, to move this through the, uh, the debate process on the floor? There are a, a great deal of amendments. I expect this to be the most controversial, so I would request most time. Uh, I don't think we need a lot of time on debate. I mean, an hour is probably all right, half hour each side. Unless the minority wishes more, I, I don't want to foreclose that. But I, I think an hour of general debate, by the time they get through making their remarks on the rule <coughs> and general debate, but then we need a lot of time for, uh, for, for uh, amendments. Mm -hmm. Now, 10 hours worked pretty well on the bill that's before us now on the floor. Um, if the minority would, would agree, I don't want to impose anything on them, but there's something nice about knowing that there is an end to this. Um, and so 10, I hours, it was last 10 hours seems like a sufficiently exhausting period of time, but uh, I would leave that to you, to your good judgment. Well, we would, uh, we would like to, uh, because of the, uh, <coughs> the approaching uh, Easter recess, uh, where we would hope to have three weeks uh, at home to, uh, to uh, meet with constituents, uh, we'd like to try to stick to that. And to do that, we probably are going to have to finish up this uh, last bill uh, by Tuesday midnight or so. And if we did that, uh, if, uh, if we have one hour of debate on the rule, which we would use for the bill itself, too. And if we used uh, another hour, or even an hour and a half, perhaps, uh, of general debate time, uh, <coughs> we could even consider that. Uh, and perhaps, uh, you know, eight or ten hours on, on the amendment process. And um, do you think that might be uh, I might think be that would be a, a, an, an excellent uh, solution. We want to finish this Monday and Tuesday, am I correct, of next, of, of next week? Yes. And so I do think there has to be some closure because um, just human nature would <coughs> dictate that. So eight to ten hours on the, on the amendments would be fine. Well, your, uh, your comments on the uh, open process to allow members to uh, work their will, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, liberals or conservatives, uh, uh, is well taken. And I support that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we will uh, certainly take it under consideration. Right. Uh, Mr. Quillen, do you have any? Thank you, Mr. Questions? Chairman. I want to commend the, the gentleman for his expertise and knowledge <coughs> of the measure before us. I agree with you wholeheartedly that block grant idea is an excellent one because the people back in local <coughs> communities and the states know what the problem is. 
Washington thinks they are knowledge in every field, but they're not knowledgeable in every field. The bureaucrats already have too much leverage and too much power, and let's take it away from them, and this is a good beginning. And I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Moakley. Yes, uh, Mr. Hyde, it's always a pleasure to discuss uh, crime, our religion, wherever we meet. Uh, the only thing, you know, I, I've worked under open rules and closed rules, and, uh, you know, one man's open rule is another man's closed rule, and this kind of thing. But I would think that if we just had a, an open rule on this, uh, 10 hours might be adequate, but I, I just think that it would, you would give the electorate or the members on the floor at least the, <coughs> the feeling that the the rules committees have become more open uh, than in the past. And uh, I really don't see it up to date. I mean, when three bills go to the floor under open rules that we used to put through in the suspension calendars, you know, that's doesn't uh, look like it. So as a result of having this bill in uh, committee, uh, do you think there's any more than 10 hours worth of debate out there? I really don't, uh, Mr. Moakley. The uh, amendments that we expect were all offered uh, in uh, the committee and were extensively debated. Um, I believe every serious amendment, and I, I, I don't mean that politically, uh, ought to be heard. Uh, ought to be debated. This is a very important concept, and it's new. Uh, it, it, that is, it's new for Congress. And uh, uh, so I don't want to short circuit anyone, but I also don't want to. to uh, I think closure is important, it's finality at some point. And 10 hours is an awful lot of time, and, and there aren't that many. Um, amendments that uh, are different from other amendments. I think that... Well, they, then why put a, a closure of <coughs> 10 hours on to avoid, uh, to avoid... Uh, Dilatory tactics? Uh, I, you said that, Mr. Moakley. I didn't, but th that is that did cross my mind. Would the, uh, would the gentleman yield? Love to. I would just say this, that, uh, you know, with all of the other uh, crime bills that have come on the floor and where uh, it has been necessary because of time constraints to, uh, to place some kind of a time limit on it, uh, uh, we have had the full cooperation of the, uh, of the Democrat leadership uh, in doing so. And as a matter of fact, many of the rank and file members on both sides, your side and ours as well, uh, have asked us to try to put some kind of, uh, of a constraint on the, uh, on the amendment process. And we just want to make sure that we're as fair as need be uh, in doing so. And uh, so I just wanted to say that we will be in, in consultation with the Democrat leadership uh, on this and other matters like it. Gentlemen, Neil. I'd be glad to. You may recall last year. You have the time, by the way. Okay. You may recall last year when you and I had made agreements and the leadership had something else in their mind. So they are not always the last source of uh, enlightenment around here. Oh, you're right. Sometimes the leadership does need prodding on both sides of the aisle. And we will do that. No, I, you know, it's an open rule if you take off the time constraints. Uh, and uh, I would have no object. To, I mean, the, the bill can be debated on the floor, but I, I just don't like to, to have any kind of uh, uh, containment on it uh, so that, uh, and then you still yeah. call it an open rule. Joe, when you, can, uh, when you can pull out of your pocket a piece of paper and you can write an amendment, how open can you be? And this rule allows that. This is, uh, uh, I'll just repeat it one more time. You never <coughs> had it so good. Well, we, when we were in the minority, never had that opportunity. Seventy percent of the time, we could not pull these bills out of our, our amendments out of our pocket and write them. Oh, yeah. And we are giving the members that opportunity, no, and I'm proud of it. As long as you're doing <laughs> that, will you go back and take all the bills we put it out under suspension and give us credit for open rules on them? Well, why don't you and I? Why don't you and I sit down and look at them? We'd be glad to reanalyze them. Suspensions, re -analyze them. Suspensions are a closed rule That's because right. you can't right. amend them. That's the way of hustling something through with no amendments. If, yeah, but that's if because you're so disposed. That's because it's non-controversial. Mm. Gentlemen, will, if the gentleman will yield, 
If the I can remember yield, last uh, last year we could we defeated <laughs> several of uh, them. Quite a, if, quite if the gentleman would yield for a moment, uh, non-controversial uh, bills. Mr. On the Chairman, if, if the gentleman would yield for a moment, he, he'll recall that the Superfund was attempted to bring up under <laughs> suspension, and that was not a modest, uncontroversial piece of legislation. Yeah, but we didn't bring it up under suspension. Because you couldn't have passed it under suspension. I voted against it. Yeah. I wasn't for it. I don't know what they're going to do with that 550-mile donut in Texas now. Fill it up. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Henry. You've been kind and thank fair you, and, uh, as usual. Thank you, sir. Mr. Uh, Dreyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Henry, for that uh, excellent testimony. And as uh, Jerry said, your work over the past uh, several weeks on uh, all of this legislation. I just wanted to ask one thing. As we watched the development of last year's crime bill, uh, we regularly saw the president stand with a cadre of police officers behind him at uh, news conferences when he was touting their strong support. In light of that, I mean, could we conclude that local governments, local law enforcement agencies support what we're trying to do with this block grant thing, or are they not? <clears throat> I really don't know, uh, not having seen any polls. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I think the first thing they have to understand what we're trying to do, it's flexibility, it's uh, uh, emphasis on local decisions. Um, and I think most people would support that. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of what I concluded, but uh, you know, I, it just uh, strikes me that uh, I think that it was the message natural. of the last election. Yeah, that, that's the way I interpreted it. But <coughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bielinson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. It is good to have Mr. Hyde back here, as, as always. <coughs> Excuse me. And on one level, Henry, Mr. Chairman, um, I agree with you. On another level, and I suppose other people must feel the same way. On the other, on another level, I have I have some real worries. I'm all for, and I guess we probably all are to a greater or lesser extent, um, all for giving local governments, uh, uh, all for, for local governments deciding what to do about crime or education or welfare, for that matter, and any number of other things that we that we might talk about uh, or, or be concerned about. But I'm I'm not all for voting on behalf of the taxpayers I represent at our level, as as the general lady from Utah quite properly pointed out. Um, to send money to other levels of government, unless I'm awfully confident about how well they're going to they're going to spend that money, it's bad enough for us um, to have to look back at times at programs that you and I and others. I'm just presuming that you may have voted for some of them, and I probably have. But you know, for federal programs that we voted for, where we discover later on that the money was not awfully uh, awfully well spent. I mean, that's it's an embarrassing thing. Uh, it's worrisome in the extreme, perhaps even irresponsible. I don't know, I don't mean to put it that way, and I'm not directing it at you or the folks who are supporting us, but I mean, for, for all of us, uh, to, vote, to vote money uh, for purposes uh, you know, that someone else is going to be spending the money for, and, and which, even though you've set forth the principles or the goals or the kinds of things they should be, setting, they should be spending it for, it's bound to come back and, and haunt us in many, many ways, and you too probably will be embarrassed by some of the, some of the ways that some of these monies have been spent. My, my question to you is, you know, sort of caught in that quandary, have you given any thought, our new, re, new Republican majority friends, to, to not sending federal money to, to the states and local governments for, for um, anti-crime purposes? Is this perhaps, and I'm just raising the question, I don't know whether you all it's talked about it or not. It's a very good question. I mean, uh, you know, because I feel that way about education. I voted against establishing the Department of Education. Um, I've got some similar feelings about welfare, although I think we should maintain perhaps some uniformity to protect states, otherwise perhaps might you know, attract people to them. But maybe we shouldn't be in this, in this business at all. I mean, enforcement, one, one of the problems talking too long, I haven't given you a chance to respond, but one of the problems I have always back home is trying to explain that most of the things we do with respect to crime here, although completely well-intentioned, may not have an awfully great effect. Most crimes are local crimes, most enforcement is local enforcement, and in one sense, I guess we can agree that we're trying to be of use by making resources available to people, and you're saying, and you may well be right, you can decide how best to use those resources, but should we even be in, in this business, you suppose, of, uh, of supplying additional f f resources from the federal level for local well, crime it, fighting? It, 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 that's a, it's a very important question. It's a fundamental question. Um, I suppose if our tax, if we didn't tax everybody uh, so exhaustively as we do, uh, there would be more resources available to local government to, to uh, stop sending the money to Washington and have us send it back to them under these block grant programs. And 
Well, happily, that day will come. But right now, um, uh, the, the government in Washington is the big tax collector, and uh, the question is how wisely may we can we spend this money? Crime, which is gen mostly a local problem, is the major problem, uh, or one of the top two or three, any way you look at it. Quite and agree. people look at it, look to us to do something. Now, one thing we can do is provide resources because we have collected the resources, and. Um, I think a more important question, uh, uh, maybe not more important, but equally important is how well is this money going to be spent? Is it going to be spent wisely? And what steps have we taken to make sure that uh, fiascos won't occur, such as happened with the LEAA program of, uh, of recent memory? Exactly. And, and, and those problems have been anticipated. And there's going to be spending oversight, although there's maximum flexibility on the local level. But the governor of every state is going to have oversight responsibility, and the bill sets up community organization involvement in the application and the spending process. Well, I saw that. I'm, I'm sure, I'm hopeful, as you are, that that will, that will help, obviously, we, we and, and make it the will. decisions. It, it is still difficult for any of us, I guess, at, at one level, to vote money to be used at the discretion, even within certain borders or certain, you know, it's certain open. limits, but by other folks. It you know, hasn't because, been because our we're habit ultimately, to do that, but we're well, going to try and break that. Well, we've done in the past, as you said, with LEA and so, and so, so, and so on, and and it, and the, not all the results have not all been good. Let me just ask one other question, if I may. Um, can the money? I think I think the answer to this is yes. I think from your testimony, I got that it was yes. Can any of this money be used for so-called prevention programs if yes. local people want to use it yes. for yes. those purposes? Yes. Okay. Could, if, if they wanted to use Including it Including midnight basketball, things of yes. that sort. Yes, sir. But okay. the, 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 the difference is the decision is made locally, not here. I understand. I understand. Because I, I do believe, I do believe um, that we're foolish, you know, if, if we ignore prevention programs. I mean, uh, un unfortunately, we've got to build more prisons. Unfortunately, we need more police. Unfortunately, the crime situation is so bad it doesn't need to be described to anybody who's who's listening in or any of us who, who are citizens you, you these know, days. But but we're foolish, obviously, and I hope the gentleman agrees. You know, to not put some emphasis and some resources into trying to choke off additional people getting into this. Jesse into Jackson has a great phrase. He says, "You don't just lock them up; you must lift them up," and that makes sense. And I think. Law enforcement and fighting crime involves both of those things. It's and got to, because otherwise, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, we're going to be spending three times as much for prisons and police, but unless we somehow find some ways of deterring people from getting into lives of crime in the first place. This bill recognizes and embraces that concept, but it just says, let the locals decide, uh, rather than we here in Washington. I, I, again, That's though, and I thank, you for, I thank the gentleman for his answer, and it's perfectly adequate and fine. Again, then, I, I would feel uncomfortable, frankly, uh, if, in, you know, after voting for a bill such as this, if I found out that local entities, despite the fact we'll all stipulate that they have better judgment than we or they're closer to the problem perhaps than we, although I don't necessarily agree, we all go home all the time, we're all citizens too, if I found out that none of this money or very, very little of this money was being spent for anything but prisons and police and more, and, and more things for the police forces themselves without trying to get to... To, to solving some of these problems. I would think that community organizations, which will be composed, advisory groups, which are part of this process, be composed of community groups, law enforcement, school leaders, a mix of the community. And, and their judgment ought to, uh, ought to be weighed heavily. But there'll be politics, forgive me, and then I'll stop here, but obviously there'll be local politics too. And these groups will be competing among one another as to how best to use this. And even though you or I or anybody else, somebody else back home whose judgment we trust I would say that mostly it ought to go to the police in order to keep everybody happy. They're going to have to parcel the money out here, there, and everywhere to all these different groups. And, you know, we can only hope and pray that it's going to be used wisely. But I would, I would expect the uh, politicians who are making these decisions to be held accountable by their electorate. They are, and but... For any mal uh, portion. I hope, I hope you're right. Well, but we, you know, we're held accountable too. We are sending the money. That's what, that's the only point I was making. I'd almost, you know, as the gentleman suggested, rather we were taxing or, or, you know, at some lesser level or whatever, and saying to local people, you all, you raise the money, you make the decisions. I'm just uncomfortable sending money for other people to make the decisions as to how to use it. That's all. And I know well, the gentleman shares that let, feeling let us, a little bit. Let us try the grand experiment and see if we. Well, can we did, as the gentleman knows, 20 years the ago. Status quo. 
The uh, Mr. Uh, Goss of uh, Sanibel, Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, Chairman Hyde, thank you for your presentation. I, I think we've covered most of the points. I did want to raise an issue. I mean, we, we have been through the LEA. We've been through the CETA syndrome, which you referred to in your opening testimony of the vanishing assets when you're out there on the hook and committed to pay these employees and you're counting on them and you don't have the dollars. And I ran into that. My background is local government. And, and I'd say to my friend, Mr. Bielenson, whose judgment I do respect greatly on this, and I think your concerns are legitimate, but I think they've been provided for. We don't have partisan municipal elections. We have nonpartisan elections. Uh, and I will tell you that when we get to the part of the budget every year in our cities and in our counties, usually the hottest topic of debate uh, and the most attended sessions have to do with law enforcement because people are concerned about crime. And people really do focus in on that. There is attention. That wasn't always so, I admit. But I, I think increasingly today, uh, as people in this country have asked us in Washington to make uh, some response to the crime problem, I think we've done it intelligently this way. We are responding, returning some of the tax dollars sent by those communities back to them. But we're doing it with some guarantees that there will be three or four steps of oversight. There'll be the advisory boards. There'll be the governor. Uh, there will certainly be a, a progress report. Sure, I agree politics can come into that, Tony. I, I agree it can. But the accountability trail is enlarged magnificently in this process. I mean, you just cannot get off the hook. Uh, if you're going to have a big hearing in a county about how much money the sheriff is going to have, and we have in uh, our major county in my district, every year the sheriff's budget comes in, the county commissioners deal with it, there's a fuss, it gets appealed to Tallahassee, it goes back down. I mean, this is a major event. This is about like spring baseball. It gets that much attention when we have spring baseball. Mr. I yield just for a moment. I, I don't argue with the gentleman at all, and I, I'm, I certainly hope he's correct. I'm sure he is. I, I was smiling only because those are and, and perfectly reasonable and proper arguments. And as I said, I hope you're correct. I think you are. I hope you are. Uh, you, just that you were making the exact same kind of arguments on behalf of this particular bill as some of our colleagues on our side have made in the past on behalf of other bills you know, saying there's local accountability and they're going to make the judgments, except for some spending program that you all don't particularly like, and I don't often either. And I can only hope and pray that uh, your bill works better than our bills have, some of them. I, I accept that. Uh, I think that the key is there be accountability at a level that matters to the people who are making decisions. Uh, and, and I think if there is the frontline accountability on how are we doing on crime in our community and, and who's uh, responsible here, we know Washington has sent some money. If you haven't used it right, you're in trouble. I, I think that's a proposition that does get some attention from the decision makers. I hope so. May, may I bring something up that's Please, important? To, <clears throat> we're going to need a waiver of germaneness on one McCullum amendment that would allow the transfer of the $10 billion from the trust fund to the local government block program. We, we, th this issue must be brought to your attention specifically. And we, for, we omitted doing that in our letter to you on this, uh, on this uh, uh, legislation. That's like the waiver Mr. Berman needed to transfer the money on the other thing. No, that was a new entitlement program. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, think that's, I think that's a bipartisan uh, yeah. amendment. So yeah. uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't have any further questions except also to, to join the congratulations for the hard work you've done in bringing all this legislation forward Chairman. timely. I'm going to suggest we have a staff day someday because the staff really works uh, uh, heroically and unacknowledged. Uh, if it weren't for the staff, we wouldn't get much done around here. I agree with that. I hope it'll be after the 100 days, not during the 100 days, though. <laughs> I don't know. It's the 100 nights I, I we have to worry a, about, uh, not the 100 minutes. Is by part of we'll see. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to know how the McCollum Amendment is bipartisan. Yeah, well, it's it's bipartisan in the uh, respect that uh, all of these bills that have been passing have been passing with uh, tremendous bipartisan support. There are only 230 Republicans, and these bills are getting 280, 290, 300. Uh, you know, that's about as bipartisan as you can get. Uh, Mr. Linder, of, Mr. Linder of Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm curious, Henry, what kind of amendments we might expect to see on the floor, in, in terms of the length of the debate, which will what were oh i think there'll be amendments to recategorize the grants so much for this so much on a percentage to go to this and local government parks and recreation and there are all sorts of special interests in the best sense of the term uh, that want to make sure they're not left out additions to the advisory council um, 
that sort of thing, and things that, that minimize the, the uh, block grant pr approach and recategorize, that sort of thing. How many hours of debate did you have in committee on these? Two days. Two days, Two days. yeah, full yeah. days. Do you think 10 hours is enough well, for, a, for the five minute I think so. Uh, do you, do, does staff agree with me 10 hours enough? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Price of Ohio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Chairman Hyde, uh, for being here today. Um, I'd just like to speak very briefly about my past experience in, in uh, the law enforcement arena as a prosecutor and a judge and a, a frequent advocate for victims' rights. Um, it, it's human nature and it's also uh, the nature of government to, when you see federal dollars coming at you, not to want to waste them or lose them. And whether or not you like the programs they're dedicated to or whether or not you even need them, um, local governments grasp for those dollars. And so I, and I've seen that firsthand and I've been involved in it, so I think that this is so, such a um, much improved uh, result over the last crime bill because uh, now local officials will be able to do what they believe they need in their own communities. And so having seen it firsthand, uh, I applaud you for your efforts. And, and, and the, the strings that we have often attached also um, create more uh, spending on the local level, um, spending of money that really wasn't necessary. And it, it also um, strikes me as being a very arrogant way to govern, that we would think we know best here in Washington. And so um, I thank you for your efforts. I think we are certainly back on the right track. And uh, with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Lincoln diaz Ballard of Miami, Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I also would like to thank uh, Chairman Hyde for the extraordinary work and leadership on this issue. I think Mr. Bielenson had a, a key question earlier when he talked about really the essence of, uh, of the role of the federal government uh, in uh, issues that are primarily local issues. Uh, in our federalism, uh, law enforcement, such as land use planning, uh, uh, is, is essentially a, a local issue. And uh, I think one thing that's, that's very positive about, uh, I have the beeper here going off, there, solve the problem. Uh, one thing that, that's, um, I think, important to keep in mind, Mr. Chairman, if we were going to help, for example, local governments with regard to land use planning, another local issue essentially, it would be better not to tell them where to authorize the construction of shopping centers. Uh, and, and, and the essence of this legislation is, number one, recognizing the key importance that the American people uh, grant uh, the crime problem and that we as our representatives uh, give the crime problem, having decided then that that's an issue as imp uh, sufficiently important to help essentially a local function, that we are going to give the maximum discretion. Nevertheless, Chairman Hyde, I think it's important if you would address, um, because the arguments were made here that uh, perhaps uh, local discretion was too extensive. Uh, the, the, the part of the bill that does state that in granting the assistance to the local governments, the issue of violent crimes will be taken, must be taken account of, must be, uh, must be uh, uh, recognized as a factor by the Justice Department. Uh, could you address that issue, uh, Chairman uh, Hyde? Well, the purposes of the bill are to fight crime, and that's, uh, uh, that's the entire intent. Uh, the, uh, but we're not telling them how to do it. But we're going to have these advisory boards made up of law some law enforcement, but also community groups, um, school leaders, and the community. It will mirror the community. Uh, they, will, they will set up a trust fund for this money, and uh, uh, the governor of the state has an oversight responsibility. And this committee, I must say, the Judiciary Committee, I mean, will follow this very carefully and, and uh, exercise its oversight, too. We don't want this program to fail. We want it to succeed. We want the local people to succeed, and we want to bring crime down. So uh, uh, I, I, just trust, I just trust the local people who are, after all, the ones that are in the trenches to right. exercise good judgment. 
what I was pointing at, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, was the, uh, that the authorization that the, uh, the funds be distributed based on the number of violent crimes in each state as compared to, to the rest of the yes, country. Yes, th that, that was an amendment adopted uh, 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 yesterday in, in the bill on prison grants by Mr. G Gallagly uh, to, to look at uh, uh, the crime rate uh, exactly. as a determining factor, yes. I, I don't know that ours does that. Does our our bill does, this not, bill does that? It yes. does the same thing. Yes. Right. Then uh, then uh, which is very good. That principle is embraced here, and it's a good one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we have about uh, six minutes left on the vote. I want to make sure Mr. Hyde makes the vote, and so do I. Mr. M uh, McGinnis. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, Mr. Hyde, uh, Chairman, I think your uh, you, uh, testimony was excellent. And I think the local control gives us maximum accountability. Yeah, I, I, you can't say it any more simpler than that. Uh, we're able to avoid, uh, I, I think, some of the hug-a-thug theories that the federal government imposes on local government. And so I uh, commend the bill. I commend your action. appreciate your testimony today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Excuse me. Are you through, Mr. McGinnis? Yes, I am. Mrs. Wallows. I would simply talk. say once again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership on this critical issue. And, and I would simply point out to those who say that, that there's no accountability, that as I reviewed the bill, you have included several pages of accounting requirements, reporting requirements, and sanctions for jurisdictions who fail to use these funds appropriately. I think there's plenty of accountability in this bill, and I thank you for your efforts. I thank you for your very valuable contribution. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Moakley. Uh, turn on your mic. Um, just to get back, you know, and for some of the new members, they may think that I'm just protesting too much on the limiting debate. But if you'd listen to this, the rule is essentially a closed rule because it limits, because it limits amendments by limiting debate on all amendments two hours. Mr. Speaker, this is one of the more egregious rules reported out by the Committee on Rules. Who, who said that? David Dreyer. A two-hour limitation? Yeah. He was right. No, no, no. It but it was. But that was on the supplemental appropriations <laughs> transfers. Uh, another one. Mr. Speaker, just let me say I oppose this rule for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is the fact that it restricts the time for amendment process just to two hours. Who said Mr. that? Mr. Mowgli, some of us take longer to get down to the floor than others. Would you think it rude if I were to leave to go vote? While you're still talking, I, if you do, I will stay. And I think Mr. chance missing the vote. But I think Mr. Moakley is going to sum up. He's about to miss the vote as well. I yeah. leave it to okay. them. That was done by Mr. Solomon. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Speaker, this rule contains a four-hour time limit for consideration of amendments. It is for that reason it's a restrictive rule. Now, who said that? The Honorable Congressman Dreyer on the ERISA bill in 8492. So I just want to show you that... Brilliant that I'm using some precedence for this. I'm not just grabbing it out of the air. No, no one ever questioned your sincerity, my friend. Keep digging, David. Uh, Henry, thank you very much and uh, appreciate it. Thanks, Henry. Uh, Did you vote? Our next uh, witness is on its, their way back. Uh, no, um, if um, Jim, why don't you take over for one second? And, we're going to continue the hearing without recessing, and uh, so uh, Mrs. Schroeder will be right back up. So just be in okay. temporary recess until she comes back. Okay. We will be right back. Here, here we go. Oh, fine. Okay. You have the floor. Ms. Schroeder? How are you? The gentlelady from Colorado, we'll hear from you. Well, I thank the gentleman, the chairman, very much for yielding. Right and uh, let me just say, as you know, we have the full committee on the floor, and we have two subcommittees meeting. So the ranking member, Mr. Conyers, is sending in a second bench, and here I am. But basically, um, he had asked for two hours of general debate, but he said, if you only do one, that's okay. And if you put a 10-hour limitation, that's probably all right, too. And so basically, I don't think he has any real quarrel with what appears to be the way the committee is evolving. Um, let me just make another couple comments, if that's possible. I have an amendment that we are trying to work out with Mr. McCollum 
that I think is terribly important, and I know Mr. Schiff is worried about it too. Um, I sometimes think maybe Mr. Bielenson and I are the two real conservatives in here, uh, because I always feel that anybody who spends money ought to have to raise it. <laughs> that, that, it that encourages a lot more fiscal conservatism than anything else. But one of the huge omissions in the areas of law enforcement, and we saw this mistake happen once before when we did the LEAA grants, was the fact that there is no central place for police entities to go for any kind of consumer advice. There are over 17,000 different police entities in America. The average number of police is 12 in an entity. So they obviously don't have their own consumer research and development. And the only people they hear from when they're buying equipment are the vendors. And you can imagine how objective a vendor is. And with LEAA, we saw all sorts of uh, police entities buying lots of stuff that first of all wasn't interoperable, and secondly often turned out to be junk or did not do what they said. Now we began, Mr. Schiff and I and others began in defense a couple years ago working on the National Institute of Justice, um, which does very similar to what the fire men do. As you know, the firemen do have a central area where they can go and say, you know, how, how well does this work and so forth. You, it, you don't have to buy it, but they've tested it so they can tell you um, what kind of heat something will hold up under, what kind of um, chemicals it can be used against, whatever. There's never been that. And now we do have this National Institute of Justice, but it is all of three people at this point. And when you suddenly are going to give federal money to 17,000 entities um, and they can spend it on anything, we see this becoming a real crunch on these folks. They have done a terrific job on body armor. They put standards on body armor for the first time. So when people bought body armor, they knew what they were getting. They knew what kind of bullets it would stop. They have done other things on fingerprints. They've done many other things. This is a very critical amendment. I assume it will be in order if we're doing a totally open rule. But I think this is one of the things that I think Mr. Schiff and I would agree that all the law enforcement people and everybody would like to have there. And I would hope that we as members would have it there or we're apt to see the same mistakes made that was made with LEAA, and we certainly don't want that again, because we will be the ones blamed for having given him the money. Secondly, I, I did just want to point out a few things that uh, were in the record, and that is last year's, last year's bill was a block grant, too. I keep hearing it categorized as all sorts of things. It was a block grant, too. Under last year's bill, you could or could not have midnight basketball, whatever you wanted. Under this year's bill, you can or cannot have midnight basketball, whichever is wanted. So there, there's a lot of things around here that are basically um, political rhetoric that I think we really ought to say. Uh, what we're basically doing this year is giving a lot less in money, and, and there is a little more limitation on what kind of prevention programs because to have them you must have police involvement with them and whereas last year you could have literacy programs and other things that kept kids off the street in my city of Denver we piloted a lot of these pro projects and let me tell you the prevention money really worked we had one of the safest summers ever with cops and so forth um, really being added to um, finally I have another amendment that again would be in order, and that is to deal with the issue of clinic violence. As you know, this would just allow this money to be used by localities in areas where there has been serious clinic violence that's just overwhelmed the localities. As you know, the Attorney General has been meeting around the country trying to find out what would happen uh, or what some ideas were. And one of the things we find is just some localities are totally overrun and others aren't. It's not a problem at all. But this would allow some of that to go in there. It models what we do in this bill on safe schools. And um, I thank you very much for letting me come. Well, Mrs. Schroeder, it's always a pleasure to have you uh, come before the Rules Committee, which you do uh, quite oft often over the years. And uh, would you just, uh, you're here also representing John Conyers, Absolutely. the uh, ranking Republican, uh, <laughs> ranking Democrat member. Yes. Uh, would you just repeat for Mr. Moakley and I, because we weren't here, 
uh, we, we hopefully will be able to put out uh, a rule that is going to allow any and all amendments such as yours that are, are germane to the bill and don't need waivers. Um, we would hope to have at least an hour or hour and a half even perhaps uh, general debate and up to 10 hours. And do you, do you think 10 hours would be adequate? My understanding is that Mr. Conyers feels 10 hours is probably adequate. He had originally wanted two hours of general debate but said one would be fine um, yeah. because we're finding where most members are wanting to participate is on the amendments and right. on the five minute rule. Well, we are willing to uh, accommodate uh, you. We, we would like to consult and to be as uh, cooperative as we possibly can. Well, I do he's appreciate. Very sorry, he can't be here. As you know, right. he's on the floor now. <laughs> no, We've got two is. subcommittees running. This is right. a four ring circus no, today. It, it, it really three. is. And, uh, but that's the pressures that everybody's under. We really appreciate your coming before us. Mr. Quillen. No questions. Mr. Moakley. No questions. Uh, any questions from the uh, Republicans of Mr. Goss? Uh, Ms. Schroeder, did you run your uh, your uh, proposed amendment by the parliamentarian to check whether you need a yes, waiver or not? Yes, it's fine. And we are working now with um, Mr. McCollum, who's also sympathetic of Mr. Schiff. We're all trying to work something out. But what I was talking about, and, and the chairman knows more about this than ever, we're just trying to model um, for law enforcement what they have for fire firemen and that is we, the central place where you can at least go and say if I buy this body armor will it work um, and the National Institute of Justice so we're hoping to be able to give that amendment because we think the money right. will be spent. Well, the reason I asked was from the rules aspect not from the substance yeah, aspect no, yeah, of whether I, or not I think you it's need fine and we're hoping it's a non-controversial one but um, thank you very much. It works out. Uh, any other questions? Uh, thank the lady for her testimony. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Any questions? Uh, Mr. Nothing Dennis? and uh, welcome the uh, Gentlewoman, and always Thank nice you. to be reminded of Colorado. Absolutely. Uh, we can't wait to get out, right? Uh, Mrs. Walholtz? No questions, you Mr. Chairman. Thank uh, you. Mr. Bielenson, you're back. Any questions? You're back. Oh. <laughs> Excuse me. I couldn't see around Mr. Moakley. Pat, we <laughs> resent that. <laughs> we really Thank appreciate you coming, Pat. Thank you again Thank very much. Thank you. Mr. Connors, as well. Yes. Thanks. Tell me, did she they ever did fix that, that uh, thing in the Denver airport where it takes you 17 hours to well, find your bag? You know, I, I really, as I heard everybody raving about how local officials spend federal money, yeah, I did want to bring example. that up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but I, being as to how it's my district, mm. I'm glad you brought it up. I could have been in trouble mm. otherwise. Thank, thank you again. I think there will be some accountability on that before we get through with it. Mr. Schiff, would you, uh, you come forward? Mr. Schiff of New Mexico is a very valuable member of the Judiciary Committee, a very uh, respected member of Congress, and a former prosecutor, so he knows from where he speaks, and we, and we appreciate your input. Thank you for your kind remarks, and also I was a defense attorney for two years, so I've walked That's that right. side of the street. Both sides. But, Mr. Chairman, right. I'll take under five minutes of this committee's valuable time. The first is, I can't resist at least a general observation based upon watching Chairman Hyde and Mrs. Schroeder discuss the last crime bill and, and our proposal. It is true that the crime bill that was enacted last year contained a small portion of funds in block grants. That only occurred kicking and screaming from the then majority side of the administration when their first uh, bill went down in a, in a rule fight. The fact of the matter is, it's more than just earmarking funds that they're supporting in the last bill. It's micromanagement, because in addition to saying a certain amount of money should go to police, uh, community policing in the last bill, the last bill goes page after page after page as to how you have to run your police department if you want to participate in community policing grants. With that, I want to talk about uh, two amendments. The first is, uh, I, I just want to verify that I am working with Mrs. Schroeder and other members. I'm trying to get some uh, allowance for high-tech funding, a recognition of that. Uh, it, actually, in virtually any bill we can, it's been suggested that law enforcement today, at least to some extent, is Wyatt Earp in a police car. That uh, to, to a great extent, the armaments and so forth have not uh, changed greatly uh, in, in the last hundred years. And that's starting to change, and we need to change a whole lot to increase the effectiveness of each law enforcement officer. Finally, I'd like to address uh, uh, Mrs. Schroeder's amendment with respect to uh, 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 law enforcement protection of clinics uh, that uh, en are engaged in reproduction services. Uh, I want to, uh, first of all, uh, allay the idea that uh, anyone who thinks differently is, of course, for violence in clinics. Nobody's for violence in clinics. In fact, speaking for myself, 
I supported and helped pass the bill that Congress enacted making it a federal offense to cause violence and otherwise interfere with access to clinics. But, but here is what I want to explain. And if, if this committee has an open rule, then, then this testimony is not necessary. We just all go out there and do our thing in an open rule. But I have an amendment before you that is related to Mrs. Schroeder's amendment, which if you define amendments, uh, I would respectfully ask be a uh, substitute, be, be able to be offered as a substitute to Mrs. Schroeder's amendment, or perhaps <coughs> her as a substitute to mine, whatever. Mm -hmm. But the amendment I want to talk to you about in my last two minutes here is related exactly to the clinic issue. I have to back up and say that when Mrs. Schroeder says uh, an amendment would allow uh, funding for enhanced security clinics, that is not correct. The way the bill is set up, there's a number of people who object to this bill, and I don't expect them to vote for it with or without Mrs. Schroeder's amendment. But the way the bill is set up, it is a block grant with, with certain general illustrations from the, from the, from the Congress as to how, what we would look for, or at least suggest, the direction in terms of our providing grants. Uh, the bill expressly says that these are illustrations and they are not binding uh, upon local governments uh, in any way or form. The bill suggests that one of the uses is to enhance security at schools, because every state has a problem with at least some of their schools. And, and that's, I think, universally accepted. There was no proposal on the other side to take that out. Rather, Mrs. Schroeder offered an amendment at the Judiciary Committee, which, if you designate amendments, ought to be designated. It was well argued and well presented, I think. But that would add as another illustration uh, protecting, uh, enhancing, I should say, security at uh, reproductive clinics. And what I, what my substitute, and that's how I'm thinking of it now, if it's not an open rule, my substitute would say that local law enforcement could use these block grant funds to enhance security wherever they might face a special incident, a, a, a risk of crime. There is no doubt that in some communities that will be reproductive clinics. Uh, we all know that, but not in every community. <coughs> in, in, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, during the Christmas holidays, the uh, Albuquerque Police Department put a special substation in the parking lot of our state's largest shopping center because of all the uh, shopliftings and car breakings that occurred. And, and as you might expect, crime dropped dramatically uh, in that particular area. It, it, you know, it, as you said, Mr. Chairman, every community is different. Every community might have a situation, an area, uh, a, a neighborhood, a building in which uh, this, it suffers a greater threat of crime than others. And my amendment would simply say wherever that is in your community, we would certainly welcome your enhancing uh, security there. And if it's, an, if, if it's a reproductive clinic, that's fine. If it's something else, that's equally fine. With that, Mr. Chairman, I, I'd uh, be ready to answer any questions. Well, Mr. Schiff, that, uh, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, uh, under uh, the, the open rule that we are proposing, uh, your amendments uh, sound germane to me. I don't think you'd have a germaneness problem. And other than the prohibitions in the bill, you know, when we, we were talking about tanks and limousines and fixed-wing aircraft, et cetera, uh, I, I believe that you should check it with a parliamentarian just to make sure. But otherwise, you would be in order under what we think we're going to uh, right. produce it. Mr. Chairman, I, I propose to testify here because I wasn't sure right. that, that it would be an open rule. And if it wasn't, I wanted to demonstrate the relation of my amendment to the amendment on that same subject I expected to be offered by right. Mrs. Schroeder. Well, thank you so much for coming before us. Uh, are there questions, Mr. Quill? Just one question. Is your amendment printed in the record? I believe it is, yes, Mr. Mr. Cole. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Chairman. Mr. Moakley? I think we printed it twice. I think we submitted it once under the wrong bill number and submitted it right. again under the right Good. bill number. Pay, pay, pays to be safe. No question. Uh, Mr. Mr. Bielenson? You printed an amendment twice. Can you bring it up again after the use of the no, We give it consideration. Bring it up in another bill just in case. Uh, any questions on uh, this side? No question. Mr. Schiff, we really do appreciate your expertise. Thank, you thank are you. a very valuable member of this body. and we, Thank you for your kind uh, We really words, appreciate it. Thank you appreciate so much for coming. Uh, that concludes the, uh, the hearing process. Uh, the, uh, we've been informed that uh, there won't be uh, a need for a waiver of, uh, of germaneness that Mr. Hyde was speaking of, so it would be my suggestion that we go right to the, uh, to the markup of the rule and uh, uh, if there is no objection to that, uh, Mr. Quillen, do you have a motion? Chairman, I have a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 728, the Local Law Enforcement Block Grant Act of 1995, 
a modified open rule providing nine minutes of general debate divided equally between the chairman and rank and minority member of the committee on judiciary. The rule provides for a 10-hour limit on the amendment process. The Judiciary Committee amendment in nature of the substitute has made an order as an original bill for amendment purposes. The amendment in the nature of a substitute is considered as read. Priority and recognition may be accorded to members who have caused their amendments to be printed in a congressional record prior to their consideration. Amendments so printed shall be considered as read. Finally, the rule provides for one motion to recommit with or without instruction. Thank you. Uh, I might point out that uh, the motion that is being made by Mr. Quillen does provide for uh, one hour of debate on the rule, uh, for an hour and a half on the uh, general debate on the bill itself, and 10 hours on the amendment process. Um, you're talking about uh, 12 and a half hours uh, to deal with this very, very important issue. We also heard testimony from Mrs. Schroeder uh, from the minority representing the uh, ranking Democrat on the uh, Judiciary Committee, uh, stating that they felt that this would be adequate time. Uh, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I would just yes, Mr. Chairman, if, uh, if I could just comment for a moment on this, uh, I had the privilege of serving as Speaker Pro Tem for one of these measures, as as you noted the other evening, and there was six hours under unanimous consent agreement uh, that they had for consideration of that, and the measure was completed in about four hours. Now, Mr. Hyde said that this will probably be the most controversial, but it seems to me that if they were able to spend uh, uh, only, only take up four of the six hours that were allotted at this ten-hour time limit. Uh, will allow the place to proceed or in a very orderly fashion and to have statements in a bipartisan way uh, that uh, believe that all amendments will be able to uh, be adequately debated, I think, makes the case very well. Thank you. Oh, very, very well. Uh, Mr. Moakley, did you wish to be recognized? Did you put the motion? The Are motion is the, the motion is put, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, I have an amendment to the rule. I move that the committee grant HR 728 an open rule. Uh, the amendment strikes the 10 hour time cap and the pre printing provision, and the text of the amendment has been made available to members of the committee. Um, Mr. Chairman, is this on block or is this two amendments or one amendment? On amend block. Oh, got it. Thank you. Well, uh, Mr. Uh, the reason uh, for this is, uh, as I showed by the statements of uh, our very illustrious Mr. Dreyer and our illustrious chairman, that you objected to time constraints, uh, saying that this is not an open rule as long as there's time constraints on it. And I, would, I, I agree with you. And uh, I just think that we should just take the time constraints off. We, we only we only objected to those time constraints when they were less than 10 hours. <laughs> Mr. Uh, yeah, does, most does, of the measures were voice voted on the floor, too. I does think. illustrious mean shining? I don't feel like I'm shining lately. It's, uh, it's been, uh, been a tough 38 days, and uh, uh, we've, got, we've got another tough 62 days to go. Well, I think you're uh, shining, uh, Mr. <laughs> Solomon, but the only problem, if you try to meet everybody's birthday with a new bill, you may uh -huh. be expiring. <laughs> well... As Ronald Reagan used to say, well, uh, Here he goes again. <laughs> seriously, uh, you did hear the testimony from the uh, representing the ranking Democrat on the committee who had no objection to this time. And as far as the pre-printing requirement is concerned, uh, this is for protection of uh, excuse me, pre-printing pre pre uh, option suggestion. Uh, is to benefit uh, not only um, those members that have been here for a while, but particularly the more than 50% of the new members in the last two years and one month. And um, uh, I believe that this does help the membership. I think that it allows us to have more deliberation on the floor. And uh, I would just urge defeat of my good friend's amendment. Mr. Bielenson. Thanks. Uh, I'd like to just say a word, if I may, on behalf of Mr. Mokley's motion. And then if the, if the chair would be kind enough to... I'd like to make another motion, too. After his? After his, right. But with respect to his. and uh, Regardless of whether his passes? Yeah, it gets, right. it's on another subject. Um, but 
Let me just preface my remarks, Mr. Chairman, and our colleagues over there by saying that I believe, and I think we believe, that, that you all are trying very hard and have succeeded, generally speaking, in being quite fair about these rules. And there's no argument about that. And I don't think it's productive necessarily to argue about whether things are totally open or not or whatever. I mean, that's it's neither here nor there. We're simply struggling, as we always have in the past, often not successfully in the past, and frankly, more successfully this year under your leadership, your, your illustrious leadership. Is that what it was? Illustrious? No, it was shining. Shining, shining. Shining, whatever. No, it wasn't shining, it was something else. <laughs> whatever, whatever, whatever great leadership you have, um, in all seriousness, in, 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 in trying to come up with the right things. As Mr. Dreyer pointed out, Mr. Hyde did say this is the most controversial of the six um, anti-crime bills. It is a major, serious effort to rewrite at least parts of the, of the criminal act of, of our violent crime act, whatever we called it, of, of, of last year. And it shouldn't be rushed through. I'm not saying that necessarily 10 hours is rushing it through. We don't yet know. We would all, I think on our side, feel far more comfortable if you'd start off by granting totally open rules. If, you know, five, six, seven hours into the process, it looks like people are being dilatory. It looks like it's going to take two more days instead of one more day that we then at that time seek and generally succeed in getting unanimous consent to limit the remaining amendments to three or four hours, whatever it might be. This is not, I think, and I'm not being pushy about it, the, you know, the, the, the best way of, of going about this. I, I wish we'd start off with a, more, with a more open rule. To a certain extain Mr. Chairman, I mean, you've got to admit, and we certainly we have to admit that you all are doing an awful lot in the first few, you know, first month or, or two or, or whatever. And I know you've got your, your 100 days, you know, to, to meet and so on, which is unfortunate in a way. You're doing a lot of stuff, and it's important stuff, and all we're saying in a sense is um, that's fine, and you, you won the right to do it, but let's do it as carefully and as thoughtfully and as, you know, rationally as we possibly can. And if it takes an extra day now and then to debate one of these major proposed changes on, on the floor, let's take that extra day. We don't, there's nothing sa sacrosanct, or shouldn't be at least, about the 100 days, and I think you'll make your 100 days thing anyway, but it's foolish to say, even as it was foolish for us to say in the past that a bill had to be passed by Monday before, or Friday before we went home for the weekend, it's foolish for you all to say, if I may say so without meaning to be offensive, that we have to finish passing this bill by next Tuesday. It'll be just as good a bill if it's a good bill on Wednesday, and we'll have plenty of time the remainder of February, March, and even, you know, after April when we come back, because we've got lots of the rest of the year to do these things. So I would just urge us to, to start off at least with an open rule, and if necessary, to close it down later on um, to do it then. And well, the I would support the gentleman's amendment. The gentleman's points are, are well taken. Uh, I, I know that uh, you do come from the uh, far west uh, part of the country, and uh, it's difficult to get back home. We really are trying to uh, stick to the, uh, to the uh, schedule so that uh, we don't interfere with that uh, three weeks that those of you that come from Utah and Colorado and California. Uh, We'd rather have one week off a month, frankly, you know, than three in one uh, month. But well, that's going a little too far. But uh, uh, are there, is there further discussion on uh, the Moakley Amendment? If not, all in favor of the Moakley Amendments will say aye. 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 All opposed will say nay, oh. nay. Evidently, the nays have it. The nays have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments to the motion? Waiting for Mr. Bielanson. Thanks very much. Is it all right if I, don't, if I have not written this amendment that I'm proposing now? Why don't you uh, recite it, and we'll okay. see. Okay. It would, as I understand, Mr. Chairman, the proposal is for an hour and a half of general debate. Yes. My amendment would be to, limit, to have general debate of one hour. I think, as, as we discussed the other day, two things. First of all, unless it's a big, you know, a, a hugely complicated and multi, and mo more particularly a multi-committee bill, where you've got to give some additional time to Energy Committee or Commerce, whatever we call it, or some others, if it's one committee, let's go back to what we've always done, almost always done, and, and just have one hour of general debate. As was, as was mentioned, I think, by Mr. Hyde, and as I think we all understand, this, the useful debate occurs on the amendments, not during general debate time. Nobody's listening then, and it's, and it's not directed at the problem in front of us. And let's get general debate out of the way. An hour is plenty of time. And if necessary, give an extra half hour if you want to. You don't need to, you know, to the debate well, on the Bielans amendments. Mr. Bielanson, I would like to strongly support yeah. Yeah. Well, I am in, uh, inclined to support it as well. I just do want to point out, though, that Mr. Hyde, the chairman of the committee, said that uh, one hour would be adequate. However, Mr. Conyers, or Mrs. Well. Schroeder speaking on behalf of Mr. Conyers, thought an hour half would be better. If you would uh, like to offer the amendment, I would, uh, we would support it. I, I think it should be our general rule to give an hour of general debate. Why don't you move the amendment? I did. I do. The amendment is Thanks. moved. All in favor of the Bielanson Amendment to limit the general debate to one hour will say aye. Aye. All opposed will say no. What was that? Oh, oh. Uh, Whose side are you on? <laughs> <laughs> uh, evidently, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. And uh, the clerk will correct the uh, the amendment uh, 
the, uh, re the resolution that is before us to uh, uh, provide for one hour of general debate. Otherwise, the, uh, the resolution before you uh, is the amendment, is the resolution we'll be voting on. Is there further discussion on the resolution before us? If not, uh, all in favor of the resolution will say aye. aye. All opposed will say no. Uh, the, uh, let the record show there were no uh, no's on the amendment. The, amend the uh, resolution is passed and uh, the resolution is reported to the floor. The Ruse Committee will, um, uh, the, uh, for the majority, Mrs. Price will carry for the majority. For, and the, for the minority, uh, I'll carry. And uh, the distinguished ranking member will uh, face up against uh, Mrs. Price. Uh, that's very good. All right. Let me. I don't uh, know if I can make a weight, <laughs> the way you've been advertising. Let me. Uh, like an athletic. Let me make an announcement for the benefit of the uh, of the members. The Rules Committee will meet at 3 p.m. this Monday to consider a rule for H.R. 7, the National Securities uh, Revitalization Act of 1995, and. The committee will meet on Tuesday at the regular meeting hour of 10.30 a.m. for consideration of certain committee business, uh, for which we will notify you later on the, this afternoon. Uh, there will uh, also be uh, uh, possible meetings as early as next Thursday on the extension of the Self-Employed Health Care Deduction Act. Uh, uh, so stand by for, for next Thursday. Other than that, we do not expect to meet again until uh, till Monday at 3 p.m. And uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Could I see you folks in the other room? Enforcement Grants Bill is the main component of the Republicans' anti-crime initiative. It authorizes $10 billion in grants and gives local authorities the choice of spending the money on hiring more police or to use it on other anti-crime programs. This would replace the 1994 law's nearly $9 billion outlay for 100,000 new police officers over six years. You can again see this hearing later at 5.20 Eastern Time on C-SPAN 2. Later on C-SPAN 2, former Vice President Dan Quayle. And that's why when you decide to run for president, it truly is a family decision. The message...